just want to pray. Lord, I just, just, as we continue our worship by uh, hearing from your word, Lord, I pray that your truth would be made clear. Lord, I pray that we would continue to be impacted by the presence of your Holy Spirit here. Lord, our heart is that we would not stay unchanged as we hear good news. Lord, our heart is that we would be captivated more and more and more with the enormous love you have for us. So Lord, I pray, we welcome you. We thank you for your presence amongst us. And I pray, would you speak through what I bring? Would you speak into our hearts? Would we have ears to hear this morning? I pray. Amen. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Romans 12. Um, last week, I talked about the fact that there's a big shift. So we've had part one of Paul's letter. It's all about the gospel. Chapters 1 to 8. It's all about the gospel. He's unpacking the gospel, explaining what it is. Saying that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all need saving. He even deals with the Holy Spirit. What about those that haven't heard? He said, you know what the heavens declare? <laughs> the creation declares. If you just look, but we're blinded to it. Jews and Gentiles, we're blinded to it. But good news has come. Christ has come. And he explains it. And then he talks about it in 9 to 11 about the plan, the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign, God is in control. And he is drawing together a people for himself from every tribe, every time. Jew and Gentile coming together to be the family of God. And as I said last week, the last few chapters are, are really some practical advice. Okay, so what? I know the Gospel. Jesus loves me. He's died for me. I was dead. I'm now alive in Christ if I've given my faith and trust in Him. Yes, you're doing this great mighty work God across the world where you're bringing together the people of God. But how does that impact today for me? How did it impact for the Roman church living in that pagan city? And these final verses, these final chapters, help us understand that. And uh, last week we talked about being dual citizens. Being a citizen of heaven, I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. But also, how do I live as a citizen here? Submit to the authorities. Pray for a new government. Whether you voted for them or not, pray for them. Pray for them. God bless them on them as their leaders. Today, we're then going back the chapter to back to chapter 12. And this is all really about love. This is verse 10. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. Love each other with genuine affection, take delight in honouring each other. So in view of God's mercy, in view of all that God has done for us, we're to love one another. Love one another. Why? Why should we love one another? Because God is love. Why should we love one another? Because God loved us first. See, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, have existed for all time. They existed before time. There's never been a moment where the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit haven't existed. And they have been this perfect unity of love. A community of love. That's why we say God is love. It's not because they kind of try to love. They are love. God is love. 
and they've loved for all eternity and they will continue to love for all eternity. And out of their love, there came this desire to create, this desire to make. And out of the love that's in the Trinity, creation begins. And God makes our universe, culminating in us, human beings, being made to inhabit this beautiful world that he's given us. This is love. And then in Christ, I could go on forever, taking us through the whole Bible, but not today, we're going to jump to Christ, where we see the eternal Son coming to live with his people. Demonstration of the love of God. And as we celebrated and shared the bread and the juice, we're remembering that very moment when the love of God was on display to all of history. I still find it amazing when I see tennis players at Wimbledon with crosses. And I wonder, do you really understand what that is? That cross you're wearing around your neck? You know, if I was to wear a guillotine from the French Revolution around my neck, people would have gone mad, wouldn't they? Or an electric chair hanging as earrings. But we wear crosses, don't we? It's the cruelest crucifixion, it's the cruelest death. They really understand what they're wearing. But in that moment, that was the love of God displayed. Amazing love. And so, Paul is saying, as you view the mercy of God, as you look over this wonderful love that God has poured out and shown us, he's saying, love one another. Just have a look around for a moment. Have a think about how you're getting on loving each other. Do I like good or Brian? That's good. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. I'm not going to do it. Okay, so don't panic. I wonder if I said to one person here, do you feel loved by the rest of the church? I wonder. I might feel I'm doing okay loving you, but do you actually feel you're loved? I haven't done you any harm. That's not quite the same as loving you with, what is it, genuine affection, is it? It's not the same. Hmm. Because love requires us to do something, doesn't it? It requires, you know, Tanya knows I love her because I tell her. She knows I love her because I do the washing up. That's why I tell her anyway. And occasionally she might get some flowers occasionally. But I do things to show my love. I wonder, how are we doing? Love one another with genuine love. You see, love is only really possible when we view God's mercy. When we allow our hearts, right, our minds, our very souls, our whole being to be filled with His love, that then motivates us to want to love others. And it's really important to understand that that's what it is. God love. I put, put it up there just to help us understand. It doesn't mean God's up there. All right? But God, God loved me. And therefore, I, I then find myself loving Him. There's this ver vertical love. God to me, me to God. God to me, me to God. God to me, me to God. And out of that flows horizontal love to Brian. Yeah? That's how it happens. Actually, left to my own devices, I might love my wife, my kids, and my immediate family, and a couple of best buddies or something. But it's hard to love the church. If you look to yourselves, it's hard. But because of the love of God in me, and I'm the view of God's mercy, I can love. I can love. I can do it. And how do we do it? Well, Paul kind of says, you need to have healthy relationships. That's really what it's about. That's how you love. Healthy relationships. So I'm going to look at verse 9. I'm just going to read these verses, alright? This is chapter 12 in Romans, verse 9. Don't just pretend to love. Do that again. Don't just pretend to love. Really love. Hate 
hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. So Paul gives us a bit of a list there of how, what it looks like to love. He's given us a bit of a list of things that we do to love. I just want to pick on three very quickly this morning. First one is right at the beginning, verse 9. Don't just pretend. Don't just pretend. Be sincere with what you're saying, isn't it? Be sincere with your love. If we're going to love one another in the church, we need to have sincerity. You will see through me if I pretend to love you. You'll see through me. You won't trust me. I need to be sincere. Not be a hypocrite. You know, when Greek actors who play different parts, they're very clever because they just put different masks on their faces. I wear this mask, it's a sad one, I must be a sad character. I wear this mask, it's a smiley one, I must be a happy character. Right? You're being something you're not. We all do that, don't we? A bit. Do you find yourself, find, you find yourself putting on a mask sometimes? You arrive in the car park and think, right, church face on, here we go. Here we go. I know that we would be sincere in our love. We really be ourselves. Because as I'm being myself with you, that gives you freedom to be yourself too. Life group is a great place for that, to be sincere. Because you're in a small group. It's hard to do it when it's 40 of us or whatever. You can actually just be yourself and be honest and real. So be sincere. Another one I'll pick up to the end of that passage. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. It's about generosity. Generosity in giving. Generosity in time. Generosity in using our talents. That's how we show love. Because, yeah, I want to love you with this genuine love. But I need to do stuff to love you. So I use what God's given me to love. Third one. Hospitality. Hospitality. What do you say at the end of this passage? Always be eager. I love this word. Practice hospitality. So I don't have to be good at it. Because I'm still practicing. It's not entertaining. I think it's really important. We, we, we get caught up in this idea of entertaining people where we have to put, you know, get the best china now and we have to do the four course meal, five course meal, seven course meal. We have to make sure we've got the nice and four in the right place and we do the most amazing food. No, it doesn't say entertain people. It says hospitality. That's just come around my house. Knock on the door. Come in. Let's have a cup of tea and a cake together. Let's eat together. But it's just what we're eating. Practice on that's how we love. So just sit back, look around. First ask some others in the church, how's that person loved you recently? Because if we're not loving, we're not if we're not doing stuff, we're not really showing our love. I want to encourage you. Right? COVID is over. It is. You don't have to isolate anymore. People are allowed to come into your home. Yes, we put on meals, like a barbecue on Sunday next week. Yeah, because we love to eat together. It's one of the things when we meet as leaders, we go, right, when can we organise the next time we eat together? Because it's such an important value of who we are. We want to eat together and be together. But it's not just about what we do on a Sunday when we eat. Now, I'm going to be honest with you here. I'm going to be sincere. I'm going to be sincere. I have to be intentional about all three of those. I have to be intentional. I really do. 
And one of these sincere and open, but do you know what? I think you might not love me if you really mean me seriously. If you mean my warts and all, will you love me? Thank you. And that's important, isn't it? But yes, I can be honest. I choose to share. Generosity. Again, I'm a bit stingy. And my natural default is to, you know, not spend money. It really is. But I, I, it's one thing that actually Tanya and I did when we first got married that really helped. Yeah, one bank account. That really helped us. It helped me, because I was really the main, main earner. But it went into a bank account that both of us spent. And that helped me learn to be generous, not in my marriage first. And from that, I then learned to start to be generous. And we decided from day one we got married, oh, we're going to give 10% away straight off. That's what we did. You don't have to, it's not legal, you have to give 10% away. But that's what we did. And God has blessed us so much. He's so blessed us. Not just with finances or support, but with family and home and friends and so many blessings. Because we put him first and said, hey, give. Be generous. Be generous. Be intentional about it. Decide. So when they announce, like I was at a meeting to a gather and, and, they, and they announced, they were talking about it and Joel and Fisi were chatting and, and uh, Joel's the leader of Redeemer in, in Worthing. Like, we're going to do an offering. I, to be honest with you, my heart went, oh, I'm an offering. That was my natural response. More money. Okay. And it's like, no, come on, Martin. Come on, be generous. All I have is God's. It's all it is, anyway. So it isn't hard to give it away. So we are. We're gathered there and offering to support uh, Ray and Ruby in Palawan, who we, we support already and we pray for. We're there for another couple, Kim and Smile, who are in the Philippines looking to go to Taiwan. We're going to support them. We're going to have an offering. Right. I'm going to now stir my heart. I'm going to be intentional and I'm going to give because I want to show my love to them and be part of it. Hospitality. You know, weeks can go by when Tanya and I look back and go, we had nobody round. So we sit down with the calendar. Tanya likes a paper calendar. I'm not sure why, she can't get into using IT yet. But she, she likes her paper calendar. It's up on the, on the kitchen wall. And we sit and we plan it out. And we go, right, well, that's a good Sunday. We can have people around that Sunday. Well, that's a good Sunday. And we do. Don't overkill yourselves. But you can get people around. And do you know what? You say to them, bring the pudding. And they bring the pudding. It's great. You get a better pudding than I'll get normally. So it's even better. I just want to encourage you, right? If we're going to love with genuine affection, three things we do. Let's be honest, be open, be real. Let's love, not pretend. Let's be generous. And let's be hospitable to one another. It doesn't have to be big things. Tea, tea, cup of coffee. Creative heart is great. Don't go on a Monday because they're shut. I found that many a time. I keep forgetting. But creative heart, right? One pound ten for a cup of tea. Can't do bad there, can you? And it's great. I love it. Meet up. Be hospitable. So in view of the mercy of God, I want to love you with genuine affection. And I want to honour you. I want you to do the same. Paul's encouraging us to do the same. But then he goes on. He goes on. Listen to this. This is verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Verse 17. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honourable. Do all you can to live in peace with everyone. I'm just going to jump to the final verse. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. This is radical gospel stuff. What's Paul doing? Well, he's referring back to Jesus. Love your enemies. That's what he's saying. Love your enemies. Love and serve your enemies. All right? Love and serve your enemies. 
you know, I think it is relatively easy to love brothers and sisters. Relatively easy. It's relatively easy to forgive brothers and sisters. It's one thing to love the people on the same team as you. But loving your enemy, that's something a bit different, isn't it? Loving your enemy. I think we are so used to that message that we're not surprised when we hear it. But just think back to the Roman church receiving this letter from Paul. Living in Rome, right? a place that glorified death. Just think of the Colosseum. Humans had no value. Just slaughtered them for entertainment. Treat them so badly. Slaves treated so badly. In fact, many, many different groups in society treated badly. I've read some awful things about Rome in preparing these sermons. It was an awful place to live. Walking down this street, very narrow streets, thugs, bullies. It was all about the powerful, oppressed, the weak. And Paul's right to him saying, right to love him. Right to love your enemies. And we're going, oh, well, yeah, of course you do. That's what Christians do. We love our enemies, don't we? I want to say to you, I'm not sure if we do. I think what we do is we ignore our enemies. I think what we do is we hide away from our enemies. We distance ourselves from enemies. We don't pay back evil for evil. Yeah, good, well done. We don't hate when they hate, but we don't really want to get anywhere near them. We keep our distance from enemies. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what Paul is saying we should do. Romans 5, put that on. I thought George was going to read it when Brendan read a couple of verses before. But Romans 5, verse 10, talks about that while we were enemies, what did God do? He loved us. He died for Cain. Yeah, while we were enemies, right, God restored our friendship, our relationship with Him. He showed us love through the death of His Son, didn't He? How did God show love for his enemies? Because I was his enemy. You were his enemy. We were dead in sin. Cut off. He did it by coming towards us. He came towards us. He came down from heaven. The eternal son, Jesus, came down and lived in our mess. I saw his cross. All right? And I thought, oh, what a lovely cross. And nothing about it, no. It was a cross where inside the cross was carved Jesus at the top, reaching down and grabbing hold of like a sinner with their arm up. And I thought, oh, I can love it. And then I thought about it a bit more. I thought, no, that's not the gospel. He didn't just reach down to put me out. He came down in the mess with me. He's actually come in it and lived in it and experienced the life with all the pain and the sorrow, with all the temptations. He's done it. I was his enemy and he came towards me. And he's now saying, do likewise. Do likewise. Do likewise. Jesus is calling us. Move towards the enemy. I think the, the last verse in this chapter sums it kind of up. Don't let evil conquer you. But conquer evil by doing good. It's hard to do good from a distance. It's hard to do good from a distance. I need to get up close. Terrible things going on in the Roman city. Right? They lived in this, 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 this society of the powerful, the strong, oppressing the weak and the vulnerable. You can understand why 
the Roman Christians might want to distance themselves from those enemies, can't you? You can understand it. But Paul is saying, in view of God's mercy, if you truly understand the gospel, however vile the context you might be in, however evil things might be, don't turn your back on those people. Don't turn your back on them. Because remember, you were in darkness. You were depraved before God saved you. So go towards your enemy. And meet that evil with love. This is radical, isn't it? Pam was in town. Pam was one of those kind of provocative, loud women who would speak their mind, would shout, wear the most probably provocative outfits you could imagine. But she's in town. And in town were a little group of Christians praying and trying to tell people about Jesus. And she was the kind of woman that was shouting, Oh, I don't know the rubbish! Oh, I don't know the rubbish! Trying to drown out their voices, really put pressure on them, make them feel uncomfortable. She did not like them talking about Jesus. And so she would shout and she would cause a right mess of a kerfuffle. <coughs> but later on, one of the women in that little group came up to her. Jenny placed her hand on her shoulder and said, my dear, you shouldn't be dressed that way. God has better things for you than that. God loves you. But Pam turned around, as you can imagine, glared and said, Don't you touch me! You don't know me! Get away from me! Many of us might have thought, oh, if that woman, should she have really made a comment about that lady's dress? And what she's wearing? <sighs> then I would never dream of doing something like that. It's not polite. But you know what? It was an act of love. It was an act of love. See, we can think loving someone is just affirming them in what they believe. Of course, love wouldn't offend them, would it? We're trying to love an enemy, surely, surely we're, we're going to try hard not to offend them, not to say something that they might feel hurt or unhappy about. But is that genuine love? The world's idea of love says to us, as followers of Jesus, don't make a scene. Just keep walking by. Do be polite. Oh, don't say anything. But certainly don't tell people if they're wrong. But true biblical love is selfless desire for the very best of that other person. That's what it means to really love. You want the very best for that person. Even if it means having to speak the truth. Truth they might not want to hear. Well, how did Pam respond to this? Like she could not stop thinking about the one thing the lady said. It wasn't the comment about her clothes. It was that God loves you. She just couldn't stop thinking about it. God loves me. God, God loves me. Months later, she gave her life to Jesus. Now working in full-time church ministry, reaching out to people on the streets, telling them about Jesus' love. Because someone loved her. Perhaps not in the way we might have thought, but they loved her. Paul is asking the Christians in Rome, he's saying this, do the lives of your neighbours offend you? Do the lives of your neighbours make you want to run away? Good, you're ready to, to imitate Christ. Or... I think Paul's asking us a similar question. Trinity Church. Do the lives of the youths hanging around the town centre at night frighten you? Do the lifestyle choices of your neighbours appall you? Does the conversation of your work colleagues 
really disgust you. Good. Because you're ready to imitate Christ and go towards them. Our sin, our rejection of God was so awful, so appalling. But he didn't turn away, did he? He didn't turn away. He came down to us, into our mess, into our offensive, evil, depraved world. And what did he do? He loved his enemies. We must never become an inward-looking club, just focused on our needs. We're called to love our enemies. To bring good news, spread the love of Jesus across our town and nation. Jesus told a story about a guy that got beaten up on a road and left for dead, robbed. Oh, oh, my heart is that I will never be like the Levite or the priest who crossed over to the side and walked on by. That was evil that had been done to this man. That was evil. But it's so easy, isn't it, to be a bit afraid of what might happen. So we just walk on by. I think we would be the guy that stops and kneels down. You know, when you kneel down, you're vulnerable, aren't you? The robbers could have still been there, but he kneels down. Genuine, sincere love on display. Did you see it? You see it? Genuine. Since he's not pretending to love like the priest might do in the temple, he's doing it. He's doing good. He's getting up close and personal. Sincere love. Generous? Was he generous? Yeah, he was generous, wasn't he? He gave his time, he gave his resources, he cared for the guy, he put him out of his way, he went and found somewhere for him to stay. Hospitable? Well, he paid the guy to look after him. So here's some money. He couldn't do it himself, but he made sure the guy was looked after. Yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, that we would be like that good Samaritan. And love our enemies. So what Paul is really doing in this bit of, uh, of the letter is reminding us what Jesus said. In verse 14, Paul says this, Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray for them. And another little story, I've got time, I'll tell you. Edna. Edna's an old lady in her nineties, still making clothes for when there was a disaster around the world so she could then send them. So like an earthquake or you know, she would be that kind of person in her nineties. She was still walking to the villages around her home to do the children's Sunday schools in the little church of England around the area because there was no one else to do it in her nineties. There came a night when two burglars, two thugs broke into her house and robbed her. Terrified her. Absolutely terrified her. Her sister, uh, no, her daughter was on the phone. Mum, are you okay? And then they said, oh, yes, it's just terrible. You won't believe it. I've got to add two more names to my prayer list. <laughs> that was her response. I've got to add two more names to my prayer list. She died a few years later and her grandson was at the funeral and was chatting to a guy who were the warners at the funeral and it turned out he was the chaplain of the prison just down the road. And it turned out that one of those thugs had been arrested and was now in prison. And he started going on to the chapel in the prison and he gave his life to Jesus. And what it turns out is Edna had been praying and praying and praying for their salvation. So although I'm saying yes, get up close is doing good, you can pray too and do good, can't you? Paul is urging the church in Rome, and he's urging us this morning, be transformed by the gospel. And it all comes from our relationship with God. We can't love one another with this genuine affection in our own strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. Left to our own devices, we, most of us aren't that generous. Left to, our, left to our own devices, we put the mask up and we're not sincere. Some of us are just naturally gifted hospitality, but the rest of us need to work at it. I need 
I move God. I need to, need to realize how much he loves me. How can I not love you? How can you love me so much? How can I not love the enemy? That I mean. How can I not? For Christ loved me and I'm still far from him. It's practical, isn't it? You see, we've got all that theology work in the previous chapters. And Paul's going, yeah, great, we've done the theology. Here's now what you do. So there you live. It's a challenge, isn't it? In view of God's mercy. David, do you want to come? Can we do that thank you song again? Can we sing that one again? In view of God's mercy, be living sacrifices. In view of the mercy of God, be a living sacrifice. Live your life sacrificially. Be loving servants. Love your brothers and sisters. I want to challenge, challenge you. How you doing? What are you going to do differently going forward? Get the calendar out. Put some things in. Love. Love your brothers and sisters with genuine affection. And rather than hide, distance ourselves from our enemies. Let's be Christ to them and go to our Lord. And bring love. Bring love. Because if we try and repay evil with evil and hate with hate, it just creates more evil and more hate. You don't have to look far in the world to see that going on, do you? But when we face evil and hate with love, it is transformative. Let's love our Lord and love those that we need. David, lead us.